Hello and welcome to Inside the Admissions Office, your one-stop shop for expert advice on the smart way to get in. My name is Ellen, and each episode I'll bring you an interview with a former admissions officer, a graduate of a top college, or an admissions expert. These interviews will take you inside the admissions office and will be full of behind-the-scenes knowledge, first-hand experiences, and application tips that will help you get into your dream school. If you'd like to chat with one of these experts, you can sign up for a free consultation at the link in the description of this episode. Today, we'll hear from Nick Stroll, a former Senior Assistant Director of Admissions at Yale University and an Ingenious Prep Counselor about what Yale admissions officers really want to see from applicants. Nick and I will break down the Yale admissions process, how admissions works behind the scenes, and what students should include in their application, especially their supplemental essays, and more. Hi, Nick. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks. So could you just start out by telling me a little bit more about yourself, about your background? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I've worn a number of different hats uh, in my career, uh, in addition to being an admissions officer at Yale. Um, I graduated from Yale, I should mention. Uh, I studied history. I was a history major there. Uh, after working at Yale, I taught high school for a couple of years, right after college. Uh, and then I went to work in the admissions office at Yale. Uh, and as, as, uh, as I mentioned, we'll talk more about this in a moment, but I was a senior assistant director of admissions there for several years. Uh, then after working at Yale, I moved to Madison, Wisconsin, where I pursued a PhD in history and educational policy studies. Uh, and I study the history of education. So I'm quite interested in the history of schools and universities like Yale. Um, and, uh, and so in addition to working with students who are applying to college, I sometimes teach courses, college courses on the history of education uh, or educational policy. So I'm really interested in um, part of the reason I think I enjoy working with students in the college counseling process is it gives me a chance to think broadly about the purpose of, of school, the purpose of college, uh, what students might want to get out of college. And so I really enjoy all of those aspects of it. And I think we'll get a little more into what goes on behind the scenes at admissions later, but could you just kind of briefly tell me what your role entailed at Yale? Right. I was one of probably uh, two dozen or so admissions officers at Yale. Uh, I, was, I started out as an assistant director, which is kind of the entry level position for an admissions officer and soon became a senior assistant director. And in that role, uh, like other admissions officers, I was responsible for reading a, uh, all of the applications which came from certain geographic territories. And that for me included a number of different US states, which would often change from year to year. Uh, I would travel to those parts of the country each fall, each summer and fall to do recruitment travel. Uh, I would then read applications from November, even October maybe until February and March. And then I would participate in the admissions committee and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but that would be the place where once all applications are read, the admissions committee is where all of the decisions, the final decisions on an application are made. We would release those decisions in the spring and then we would start to recruit uh, for the students who were admitted. We would do our best to convince them then to come to Yale and the cycle would then start once again in the summer. I'm really glad you also went to Yale because I think it gives you a more comprehensive perspective. I'm wondering because I think students have, especially at the high school level, sort of um, an inclination to link all the Ivies together, all the top elite schools together. But from your perspective as a student and as an admissions officer, what makes Yale unique compared to some of these other top schools, even just some of the Ivies? That's a good question because I, I agree that many students who are just starting out their college research tend to think that all of the Ivy League schools are, are the same. And there are some same some similar characteristics between them. They're all very difficult to get into, for example. But at an individual level, they are actually quite different. And so you have some Ivy League universities like Cornell or, or the University of Pennsylvania, which come to mind, which are quite large, and Harvard as well, which are large universities. And by that, I mean, they not only have a, a fairly large undergraduate population, maybe six to 10,000 students, 
but they have massive graduate student populations and grad many graduate schools, sometimes in the tens of thousands. On the other hand, you have then a set of kind of medium sized schools, Yale would be among those, where there's about 6,000 undergraduates and about five or 6,000 more graduate students. And Yale has graduate schools like the law school and the medical school, but they don't have all of the graduate schools that you might find at, at a larger university. So there's no school of education at Yale, for example. Um, and then, of course, in the Ivy League, you have some small, almost liberal arts colleges like Princeton comes to mind, which, which is small. It's also outside of an urban area. And all of in Dartmouth as well might fit into that. These places all have different um, cultures. They have different kind of feels. Some are in cities, some are in the center of a city. Uh, University of Pennsylvania is in a big city, Philadelphia. Um, it, Yale is in a smallish city of New Haven. And then Princeton and Dartmouth are, are kind of more in your more kind of, you know, rural settings. So they are quite different. Um, in terms of what sets Yale apart at a, at a campus level, uh, I cert a lot of my opinions on this would be formed both in my time as really in my time as an undergraduate as much as my time in, as an admissions officer. And I think what has always struck me about Yale is that Yale is a place where students really love to get involved in extracurricular activities. And so <clears throat> that was certainly true when I was an undergraduate. Uh, students, you could say, often cared more about what they were doing you know, after classes uh, in, in clubs or maybe theater or sports, whatever it may be. S Yale students were often involved in multiple extracurricular activities. Um, that's not to say they did not take their academics seriously, many did, but that's a different feel, I think, than you might find at some other college campuses, whether they're Ivy League or not. Um, some college campuses, many students spend the weekends in the library, uh, very concerned about how they're doing. Um, they're, the schools can have a more competitive academic feel. Uh, Yale, to me, never felt particularly competitive academically. I mean, people take it seriously, but students weren't competing against each other. Rather, Yale was a, a very kind of collaborative place where, where people were very social. That's probably the best way I would describe it, is Yale students tend to be very social, want to get to know each other, want to get involved in activities. And it's hard to quantify that exactly. That's more of the feel that you might get when you visit a campus. And then certainly when you're admitted to a campus in the spring, uh, if you're lucky enough to be admitted to Yale or other schools, go visit get a sense of, of what it's actually like to be a student there and talk to students to get a sense of those small differences that might uh, make Yale different from Harvard or Princeton, for example. And for students who aren't able to visit now, maybe because of financial constraints or even just the pandemic, I know that you can email admissions offices and ask to be connected with a current student. Is that what you would recommend? Yeah, I think talking to current students is a great is a great option is one of the best options certainly they um the, and and, if, and the key would be to get multiple perspectives uh, if possible um you may, some students may have you may have older um alumni of your high school for example who've gone to a school like yale or maybe looked at yale themselves those could be great resources yes i think talking to students reading the student newspaper i think is a tip that i would give you can read those all online these days see what the top stories are, uh, see what students are writing about in the opinion pages. I think if you read the, the student newspaper, some, some places have multiple newspapers. If you do that on a regular basis, you'll get a sense of what topics students care about, uh, what the main issues are being debated on campus. And that's another helpful way to get a sense of what uh, students at that school are interested in. That's really good advice. And what would you say about what kind of students is Yale looking for? Obviously, there's no like monolith of like, this is a Yale student, but maybe like more abstractly, kind of like what attributes should students explore? What attributes should they maybe showcase in their application if they're really trying to hone in on school fit? That's a good question. I think um, the way to describe it would be that um, at a place like Yale and, and many other Ivy League schools, the, the academic excellence or academic achievements are going to be kind of taken for granted in a competitive student's application. So if you are a top student in your high school, you've taken, you've taken all of the challenging courses, uh, you have you know, excellent uh, recommendations from your teachers, um, those are gonna be great. Those are gonna serve you well everywhere you apply. Um, but what that means is then you're gonna simply be in the conversation at a place like Yale or Harvard or Princeton. What 
will make you stand out, I think, in those places is a couple of things. Um, one is, is having a sense of what the school is looking for, and I'll talk about that with regard to Yale in a minute, but also why you would be a good fit for that school and, and, how, and thinking about how you can make that case in the application. And we'll address that as we look at some of the supplemental questions for Yale. But Yale, I think, um, related to what I mentioned above, Yale is a very, uh, is a place where um, students really like to get involved, as I mentioned, on in-campus activities. And Yale values that. I know Yale admissions officers value that in students. Um, they, um, they value students who they know are going to get involved in activities and not just be, um, not just focus on their classes. And so uh, you, the, you know, in order to, whether you're thinking about starting thinking about college in ninth or 10th grade um, or 11th, you want to, in high school, get involved in activities uh, and become a leader as much as possible in one or more high school activities and demonstrate, that's the best way you can demonstrate to a school like Yale or other schools, that you are someone who likes to get involved, to meet others, that you can work with others. Um, Yale is looking, I think, you know, we at Yale, we were most interested, I think, in whether a student would be a good roommate, a good dinner conversation partner, um, whether they would be um, focused on helping others, you know, in their classes and not just being competitive about it or, you know, or competing with others. Um, we were looking for people who would collaborate, who, who would be good community members. Uh, the academics, there were plenty of students who were excellent academic superstars, but who did not have those personal qualities. And so we were looking for people who, in addition to being really great at academics, wanted to make a difference, you know, in the Yale community. And that could also be through community service, you know, in New Haven and on campus. So really those, um, at a place like Yale, extracurricular, your extracurricular involvement, I think, plays a bigger role than at a place like even Harvard or, or Princeton or even Stanford, where, you um, Perhaps if you are an academic superstar, maybe the strength of that is all that is will be enough to get you in. But at Yale, uh, Yale really wants people who will also get involved in campus life. So students can decide between applying single choice early action or applying regular decision. And obviously the single choice early action deadline was November 1st, so that's passed. But for students who are going to apply next year, how should they decide between those two admissions office? Where's the strategy for that? That's a good question. I think uh, as I answer that question, I'll, I'll back up a little bit and, and provide some context for what all these terms mean, like single choice, early action. <clears throat> single choice, early action. First, first of all, early action. Uh, it, there's two kind of early terms. One is early action and one is early decision. Uh, early action means that you can apply early to a place like Yale November 1st. And uh, if you are admitted, in that early round, you would receive you would receive your decision in mid December. If you're admitted, then you do not are you not bound to attend Yale, uh, and you can still go ahead and apply to other schools in the regular decision round and weigh your options. Single choice early action means that Yale asks that you only apply early action to Yale November first, which means you cannot they, you cannot apply to Harvard early action and to Yale early action. Both are single choice. You have to pick one or the other. And Yale asks, Yale has that program because they want students to think of the early action program as an opportunity to signal to Yale that Yale is their top choice. And so Yale will interpret a single choice early action application as a sign that Yale is the student's top choice school. So that would be from Yale's perspective what they see as the purpose of early action. Other schools, just as a note, have early decision programs, which the name sounds similar, but that means that. Uh, if you are admitted in those early decision programs, then you are bound to attend and you have to withdraw all other applications that you may have ongoing at the time. Those early decision programs, which are binding, give a, give a substantial boost to applicants in the process, precisely because schools know that a student will attend if they're admitted. For places like Yale or Harvard, which have single choice early action, you get a slight boost, I would say, from applying early action because as I mentioned, Yale interprets that as a sign of strong interest, but it's not the type of boost you might get from early decision. So as students make that choice, uh, they need to weigh a lot of factors with their, with their counselor, with their family, you know, and in their own mind about what is, they should first decide what is their top choice school. Uh, 
If it's Yale, and if their application characteristics, such as their academics and extracurriculars, suggest that they're competitive at Yale, then they should apply single choice early action if Yale is their top choice. That's and that's probably the most simple way to put it. And we're going to come up on to the uh, early action, early decision uh, decision day in a couple of weeks or like mm -hmm. a month of actually. What should students do if they're deferred? If students are deferred, um, then the uh, the most important thing to do is to if you're deferred in mid December. Um, take a couple of weeks to, you know, to take a deep breath, relax, uh, complete your regular decision applications. Then around mid-January, maybe end of January, uh, you'll, you will want to send uh, Yale or any school you're deferred a kind of mid-year update, which would usually include your first semester grades from your school, your first half of the year grades, uh, and any updates on things you might have accomplished. Maybe you won a debate tournament, maybe you, you know, your soccer team won a championship in the fall after you had submitted your application. You would wanna include a brief letter, usually no more than one page, updating any new news on your application, as well as a brief uh, reiteration that Yale is still your top choice. Uh, and so all of this can, is, can be done in one letter, we, in one page. We have lots of advice on how to write such letters on the Ingenious website. But my advice is to keep the communication simple, to keep it just to that mid-year update, unless there's major development uh, that you need to share with Yale. But to, to share an update which provides you know, new news since you applied and also reiterates that Yale is still your top choice. It's not required that students do that to be considered in the regular decision round, but it is something that I know that admissions officers look for. They want to hear that the student is still interested in Yale. Um, if admissions officers don't hear from a student in terms of a letter or mid-year update, sometimes they assume that a student has lost interest in the school they applied early. And sometimes maybe students do change their mind. But if that's not the case, send a, a letter updating them. I will say for students who are deferred, many students have the have the sense that their chances are then are then gone, you know, that they're not going to have a chance to be admitted in the regular decision round. However, that's not the case. Uh, when I was at Yale, actually, students who were deferred in the early action round had a slightly better admission rate than the regular, regular decision um, applicants themselves. And partly that's because Yale still considers, still remembers the fact that they applied early. And so they still know that this is the top choice school. So your chances are actually still quite strong in that regular decision pool if you applied early. So don't not, you know, all is not lost. It's good to know. I did apply early action to Yale and I got deferred and I just wept. Nobody told me about the letter of continued interest. So I just wept for a while. But for students who do get deferred, it's not the end of the world. And we will be releasing a special podcast episode on what you should do. So mm -hmm. hold tight. And then I think another question I have is that it might be a little bit difficult because you're not currently in the admissions office, but how would you say your peers in the admissions office right now at Yale are thinking about test optional policies, both in general with kind of the shift towards it as well as with the coronavirus? <clears throat> That's a good question. I've been trying to get a sense of that throughout my counseling work with students. Um, I can tell you from last year, I, had a, I was working with a student who applied to Yale. Uh, he applied um, early action. And he had a very strong um, academic record, you know, top student in his high school. He had excellent um, credentials all around, extracurricular involvement, everything you want to look for. But his SAT scores were a little lower than the Yale median. I think the, uh, his, his total SAT scores were in the mid 1400s, which is very good scores, of course, on a national level, but is below the typical uh, average score for admitted students at Yale. So we decided to not submit his test scores to Yale as part of his application. So he did not submit those SAT scores. He was deferred in the early round uh, and he was accepted in the regular decision round. So that, that every case is different, of course, and I wasn't in the admissions room, but that was a sign to me that I don't think it hurt him to not send those scores in that particular case. Um, we've been collecting data at Ingenious and, and others, other counselors could probably speak more to what the data shows on a broader level. Uh, my sense of it though, anecdotally, is that 
uh, Yale, it, it's totally fine for students to withhold scores. That if schools like Yale, if they don't receive a score from a student, they do not make an assumption that they scored poorly on the test and they are evaluating fairly what they have in front of them. I don't know if that's the case for every school, but I think for them, I think for the most part, knowing I still know many admissions officers, not just at Yale and elsewhere, many admissions officers, I think, are relieved not to look at have to look at test scores. Because there's many cases where we would see a student we really liked, an application we really liked, and the test scores were a bit lower than the average range. And sometimes that would knock them out of consideration. We couldn't get them through admissions committee. But now if an admissions officer doesn't have to worry about that. If they are presenting a student in committee and they there's a lot, it's an excellent application. If there's no test scores, then that's just not part of the consideration. Uh, and so I think it's I personally speaking just for myself, I think it's a great thing that standardized tests are becoming less of a central factor in the admissions process. And while I would still advise students that I work with to take the SAT or ACT and try to do the best they can. Um, I, I also tell them that they don't have to put as much pressure on themselves for these tests as they might have just a few years ago. That's wonderful. That makes me so happy. I just imagine just so much silly little stress over a silly little test, you know, makes, we, makes I, I, I do know that I do know from some of the research and reading I've done, functionally, these tests do more to, to keep students out than to get them in. I know that some students that I work with, they're eager to get a certain score, maybe a 1500 or 1550, because they think if I just get that score, then I'll be able to get into my the school that I that I want. But the, the scores, SAT or ACT scores, even if they're perfect scores, they'll never get you in. They're just one more sign that you're an excellent student. However, on the other end, lower scores would sometimes keep students out in the past. And so I'm glad that those that, that can kind of be eliminated as a barrier for some students who would otherwise do great at a college. And you kind of talked about already what your job looked like through each season. You know, you have your recruiting, you have your reading the applications, you have your, you know, going after the admitted students. Could you talk us through more specifically the admissions process? So you get your applications, you're sitting at your desk, here's your stack of applications, what happens next? Right, so I would probably all of my, um, you know, in a typical year, let's see, I think one of my years at, at Yale, I, I read, um, I probably had about seven or eight U.S. states that I was reading applications from, and that would include, for me, for me, it was a number of Midwest states like Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, but also Colorado, the Dakotas. I had a lot of kind of Rocky Mountain states one year. What that means, if, if I'm responsible for that geographic region, that means that I am the first application reader for all applications which come from those, from schools in those states. And so um, on November 1st, I would sit down, I would see a batch of applications that were in from those states. And um, over the course of a year in early action and regular decision, that would probably be anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 applications total that I would read between November 1st and maybe the end of February. And so for every application, if, let's say an application came from the state of Colorado, which was my area, I would read the application first. I would make fairly detailed notes about each component of the application. Um, I would give it some some broad kind of ratings in areas which weren't very scientific. They were just kind of a way for me to keep track of what I thought of, of an application. Uh, and then I would write some summary comments. And if I thought the application was competitive, then I would send it to a, a second admissions officer for an additional read. Uh, and that was usually a random person, just another admissions officer somewhere else in the office. And it would go to someone else. They would read it. Uh, without looking at my comments, and they would issue their own comments and ratings on the application. I, For applications which I read which I did not think were competitive, which I can't think of how many that might be, that could be as many as, you know, half during the regular decision round, that would be, I would usually eliminate them by academics first. So if there was, if a student was not taking the most competitive courses in, or most challenging courses in their school, or they, you know, they, they didn't have a top GPA. Um, and I just knew that they wouldn't hold up to the many other thousands of applications we had. I would not send that application on for a second read. And I would just, you know, I would, I would make notes on it. Um, and so after all of the applications had been read, 
I would then sit down and look at my area, say Colorado, and I would prepare to take, I would, I would kind of look at the applications. I'd, I would take them then to the admissions committee. And by that, I mean, it would be um, myself. It would be a couple of other senior admissions officers. Um, usually the dean of admissions or someone else very senior in the office would be there. And then oftentimes a faculty member or perhaps an administrator from the university would join us. And there'd usually be five or six people total. And I would present the, all the applications from the state of Colorado to the admissions committee. For applications which I did not see, they would actually look at every, the, the, a, as a slate of data for all of the applications. We wouldn't go through all of them in detail, but the applications which you know I deemed were not competitive, they sometimes would look through the, the comments I made on them and ask me questions, you know, why isn't this application competitive? And I would have to explain why. Um, sometimes they would ask to look more closely at it. But our main discussion was focused on the applications which after being read by both me and another admissions officer were rated the highest. And so we might read the top, you know, 30% of applications in Colorado. And then we would go through each application in detail, sometimes reading essays, reading a teacher letter, uh, hearing the admissions officer's responses to the application. And then after going through each application, we would vote whether to admit that student or not. And our goal was we didn't never had a specific number we were looking for, but we knew that if we were hearing maybe 30% of applications from Colorado and the admission rate in a particular year was probably going to be, you know, 10% based on previous histories, we'd probably try to, we try to aim around admitting at least, you know, that amount of, of people. So it was very tough. Um, those, those students, all of those students who got discussed in the admissions committee were excellent candidates. They were all students, in my view, that would, would be great at Yale. Uh, they were excellent academics. They, had, they were involved. They had excellent teacher letters. And so it was really tough to make those choices as to which of these students we would actually offer admissions to. And so there were many more qualified candidates than there were um, people that we could admit. But it would be sometimes a, sometimes it was an easy decision in committee, we all agreed. Other times there would be disagreements and we would try to work that out as best we could. But for applicants, I think the important thing to know is that um, you want to write your application and your essays in, with the idea in mind that many people will be seeing them, not just the admissions officers. So sometimes uh, we would be discussing a candidate, the admissions officer would have a have a, um, an interpretation of the student's application, but then a faculty member might be in there, maybe a, a math professor or a history professor, and they would say, let's look at the student's personal essay. And we would put it up on a large screen and the admissions committee would kind of read it together right there. And the faculty member might have a particular view on what they were reading and other admissions officers might have different views. And so when you write your essays as the applicant, you want to be writing for a general audience. You know, you want to write clearly, certainly. Uh, you want to, you don't want to use words or concepts that not everyone would understand. So that's something I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, but the good news, if you're being discussed in admissions committee, it means you're an excellent candidate. Uh, and even if you're not admitted to Yale, I suspect that you're going to be admitted to lots of schools because that in itself would be making it quite far along in the process. I know that's something that we, our counselors, talk a lot with STEM students is that, you know, these admissions officers primarily come from a humanities background. So you got to break it down for them. They didn't take organic chemistry. You got to break it down. And that's generally good advice for anything you're writing is to make it readable to the most like general basic reader rather than trying to like rely on like large fancy words to seem intelligent and that's something a lot of academic writers like researchers could take that advice as well if you've ever read too many academic articles mm -hmm. that's good advice i will i will add that that it, it is it's a good practice um if you are if you're a stem student and you're writing about why you're passionate about chemistry to be able to write in a way that would be compelling to someone with a humanities background and vice versa. If you're someone who's passionate about history, you might be, you might have a STEM professor reading your application. And so it, if you can write an essay that's compelling to someone from another field, then I think you're on the right track. Totally. And I'm also wondering, 
do you have a, like a specific memory of a student who you really wanted to get admitted and they didn't get through committee, a student that you maybe disagreed with, an essay that was really amazing that you remember? That's that's a good question. I don't know if I have off the top of my head, I'm, I'm trying to think there's many students, I'll say, that I wished had been admitted, but were not. Um, it's uh, it's simply a um, and that's something I should just stress for anyone applying to these to the Ivy Leagues these days, not just Yale, to really understand that not if you are not admitted to a place like Yale or to other Ivy League schools with admissions rates certainly less than 10 percent, sometimes even four or five percent, that um, many of the students, most of the students in our applicant pool would be just fine at Yale and would contribute many things to the campus. So there were lots of students that were left out. I think that what's important to realize is that there are there are lots of, in the admissions committee, there's lots of factors at play that someone like the, the admissions dean has to consider uh, when we're making our final decision. So the, the dean, for instance, is hearing from lots of corners in the university about their needs in the admissions process. So for example, recruited athletes at Yale, you know, there would about be maybe 150 or 200 of those every year, which had slots reserved for them. The, the dean had to make sure that those students were admitted. Uh, the, the, uh, the dean was hearing from the music department, which said that maybe they needed a clarinet or they needed a tuba, you know, that year, or they needed more violin players. Um, and so, um, some, or, or they might be hearing from electrical engineering in a given year where they said, you know what, we, we really, our majors are dwindling. We need some more people who are interested in this. And that, so in a given year, there will be some contingency to the process in that the Dean of Admissions might have a sense of, of certain parts of the university which are looking for certain applications. And that can tip the difference. If you might have two excellent candidates, but if one is a you know, top level clarinetist, maybe that tips the scales, you know, in their direction in a, in a given year, but maybe the same wouldn't have happened in the next year. So there is, that is where some of the randomness comes into play uh, in the admissions process. Uh, Natalia from the University of Chicago, she made a very similar kind of statement about, you know, one year you Chicago might need 10 clarinetists and then the next year they already have 10 so they don't need any clarinetists I don't know if that's how you refer to someone who plays the clarinet mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. yeah it is I think helpful to students to just say like it's not a personal reflection of you your intelligence your character you know it's just really random and you have to be resilient and keep pushing forward so are there any major mistakes that you would often see in applications major mistakes in applications um off the top of my head, I don't, I don't think there's one particular mistake that students make. I think that when we're working with students at Ingenious, for example, the goal is to really um, help them put forward their authentic self. Uh, I think perhaps if we're thinking about general mistake that students might make, it's that they try to present themselves as something that they think the college wants to see rather than really who they are. And the best applications are the ones which are a clear and coherent picture of you, the applicant. And that's what makes you attractive as an applicant. Colleges are, it's, it's virtually impossible to try to figure out what a college wants and write an application that fits it. Even though many students and, and many families, I think, think that that's the way it works. Uh, there isn't a cookie cutter profile that works for any of these top schools. So a mistake would be somehow not presenting yourself as who you are, trying to present yourself as someone who you are not, that is. Yale gives students the option to pick up to three areas of academic interest. In what cases would you recommend that a student chooses two or three rather than just putting one area? I think that many students put, many students that I work with put at least a couple, but you can put one, two, or three. Think of these academic interests as simply ways for you to signal to Yale what you're interested in. So if you're interested in three different areas, then explain briefly why and explain briefly how they might fit together. Uh, but even if they don't fit together, I think that's okay. If you have a, a good reason why you're interested in each of them, that's fine. And that can make you very interesting as an applicant. Uh, they should have some basis in the rest of your application. You know, so if you mention three, if you mentioned political science, uh, linguistics and chemistry, three random majors, 
that should make sense based upon the rest of your application, that you have some experience or interest in each of those areas. So they shouldn't just be random choices. You should have a genuine interest in each. Uh, and they're just another way for the admissions office to try to help the admissions officer envision how you might fit on campus. Uh, ideally, if you mention two or three, the admissions officer could could envision you choosing any of those as a major or just doing, you know, or doing both or, or perhaps all three. So the Yale application includes four 35 or 35 words student let me start again. The Yale application includes four short answers that are 35 words and then two essays that are 250 words. How would you say that students should approach these? What are admissions officers looking for? Are there any major mistakes that you see in these supplemental essays? Sure, I do have some thoughts on these. Uh, as I've, you know, the Yale's supplemental essays have changed over the years. Sometimes it's, it's not uncommon for schools to update or revise their essays. Yale has had these questions at least for the last few years, I think. I'll start with the 250 word essays. There's two of them, two choices at least. Um, the first one is, and each of them I think asks, is looking for different things. So I'll try to give you a sense of what I think each essay is looking for. The first question is, asks, you know, Yale's extensive course offerings and vibrant conversations beyond the classroom encourage students to follow their developing intellectual interests wherever they lead. Tell us about your engagement with a topic or an idea that excites you. Why are you drawn to it? This question, I think, is clearly trying to get at a student's intellectual and academic interests. They don't just want to know in this question what you want to major in, but they want to know kind of what deep questions fascinate you. You know, what is the meaning of life is probably a little bit broad, but it's something along these lines. Um, some maybe an idea you've encountered in one of your courses or um, a, a theme that you've seen in history or in literature that you're fascinated by. They really want to kind of know what uh, gets you what you would be excited to talk about. And so that's definitely a question that looks for intellectual once they want to hear about your intellectual interests, they want to think about what connections you could make in the classroom. So more of an academic focus question, I think. Um, the second question that they, the second question options include uh, reflect on a community to which you feel connected. You know, why is it meaningful to you? Or reflect on something that has given you great satisfaction. Why is it important to you? I think with this question, this is one that's certainly focused on how a student will contribute to the campus and what a student will be like interacting with others. This is one of those questions where they are searching for information about what kind of roommate you would be, what kind of friend you would be. Um, would you be someone who would work well with others or would you be someone who would not work well with others? And the way they make that judgment is what you choose to write about and why. What do you identify, they're interested to know what you see as a community, what you see as the communities you're part of, uh, and then what you, what you get from those communities that you're part of. And so this is an opportunity for you to talk about how much you learn from others, uh, how much interacting with others has changed your worldview or shaped your perspective. They really want you to kind of step back for a moment and think about all of the things that you can learn from working with others and, and talk about why it's a valuable thing to make connections with others. These questions I can say can sometimes, you know, this it, you would be surprised, it can be easy to eliminate with students with their responses to these questions. If you, you can imagine finding a student who's an academic superstar, but really is unable to articulate why they're, or a, you know, a community that they're part of or why it's important to them, or maybe they choose a silly topic about that, a silly type of community, uh, or, or they don't explain how, what they've learned from others then the admissions officer then doesn't get a good sense of, of how they might, you know, how they might, um, how they might act on the Yale campus, whether they would be a good friend. Um, you know, we don't, we didn't want at Yale people who would just be in the library all weekend. So this question is a good chance to expand upon that. What kind of person would you be on campus? So those are the two longer essays, and they should be, of course, complementary to whatever you choose to write about in the, in the personal statement. Um, they, they could mention some of the same things, but they should be complementary. They should provide new insights beyond what's already been mentioned on the longer essay. For the shorter questions, the 35 word short answers, my first piece of advice would be to take a deep breath on these. Uh, they're not make or break. 
Uh, they can be for some students and probably myself included, if I had to answer these, I would be I would be anxious about what's the right answer. Uh, there isn't a right answer to them. Uh, and don't worry too much. You're not going to blow your application with a certain answer to these. But at the same time, they are, like every part of the application, another chance to, to give some insight on who you are as a person. So feel free on these questions to have some fun, you know, to use more casual language, uh, to be a little, to be kind of funny, uh, and mention something new that you haven't already mentioned elsewhere in your other in um, essays or in your activity list. Maybe this is where you mention a favorite movie or another quirky interest or hobby. This is a think of every question as a chance to relay something new and different, a new insight about who you are as a person. That's really what these are. They want to get to know you with these questions. A lot of our students are very talented as far as a musician, a visual artist, and they have the opportunity for Yale to submit an additional art supplement. I know when I applied, I think I submitted audio of me singing because I was classically trained uh, in music. How should students decide whether or not they should submit that art supplement and how is it viewed in the admissions process? For arts and, and, um, and I should say music supplements, art or music supplements, um, these would be for, for students who, whether, they, whether they're an artist or whether they play an instrument, these would be students who would other, might otherwise be considering an art school, if it, comes, if it were art, or a music conservatory, if it were music. So this, these should be students who are, have played an instrument or produce art at a very high level to begin with. So if it was a musician uh, who is submitting an art supplement for violin or you know, trumpet, or trombone, these might be students who, um, you know, they certainly play in probably a regional or even national orchestra. They probably take private lessons um, already in the high school level. And they might, if they're very good, they might be considering a school like Juilliard or Oberlin, which would be music conservatories, but they want a liberal arts education to go along with their strong music application. So at Yale, one of the, this is one of the unique aspects of Yale, I think, is that Yale is a fantastic place for undergraduates who want to study an instrument or music or art at a very high level, but also, but not to do it at a conservatory. They want to, that is, go to a regular liberal arts college and have excellent music instruction because there's some unique opportunities with the music school. But what students should know is that they're, um, there's really no harm, I think, in submitting a music or art supplement, but the arts and music supplements will be evaluated not by admissions officers, but by faculty from the art or music department. And faculty will evaluate them against the, the top undergraduates that they work with, which is a very um, challenging evaluation. So, and if students are not, um, if fa faculty usually have a rating system, if students are not very high, uh, are not rated very highly by the arts or music faculty, then it would simply not play a big part of their application. But if there is a student who, who um, submits an art or music supplement, which is rated highly, it can be a nice boost uh, to their application. Again, that can depend on the instrument. Uh, this is something to talk with your counselor about, but violinists are more common than French horn players, for example. Um, because uh, they're they're just they're of course simply more common. On the other hand, um, piano. Even if someone plays piano at a very high level, piano is not really used in the orchestra. So uh, piano is less valuable than than violin because a violin can fill a spot. Uh, again, for that case where Yale is looking for maybe some violinists in a given year. My last question for you is just, if we have some younger students listening, perhaps even eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, how would you recommend that right now they build their profile if they're in a couple of years, they really wanna be at Yale? That's a good question. I, um, I get this a lot from students I work with who are younger, maybe ninth or 10th grade. My first piece of advice to any student is not, not to build a profile uh, for high school profile with any specific school in mind. Uh, I say that for a couple of reasons. One is that you should always be pursuing activities in high school, which you number one, enjoy, and number two, which will help you grow in some way. Maybe they'll help you develop a new skill. Maybe they'll give you some experience in a new activity. Maybe they'll help you develop leadership skills. Everything you do should help you kind of grow as a person and be something that you enjoy. Sometimes, of course, in high school, it takes a while to find those activities. You may try some things in ninth and 10th grade before you settle on your your top activities by 11th grade. 
Um, but if you do those, if you do several activities to a high level and you become a leader in those activities, you're going to be impressive at a school like Yale and elsewhere. The second thing I would say is that the second reason to do that is, is students' preferences change over time. So a ninth grade student who has their eye on Yale may, by 11th grade, may have their eye on a different school or vice versa. So I would simply say, don't take a, um, a specific school into account when choosing your activities. Instead, uh, try to choose, you know, at, try to choose two or three, I think, significant extracurricular areas or activities that you can become a leader in in some way by your junior year. That's really a goal to look for if you're shooting for top colleges. And if you do that, you would be competitive uh, at Yale and other places. And then I think the challenge is simply when you're applying to Yale is to be able to explain how those activities fit together and say something about who you are and what you want to study in college, and then why studying at a place like Yale would be a good place to do that. And that's something that that is figured out with you and your counselor and family, you know, as you're applying. But in terms of choosing activities, you can do anything. There's no sets of activities that are better or worse. If you kind of give your best effort and, and you're doing things you're passionate about, you're going to stand out. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nick. I'm sure our listeners appreciate your insight into admissions at Yale. For more information, check out our blog linked in the episode description. If you have any questions or would like to request a topic for a future episode, go ahead and give us a follow and send us a message on social media with the hashtag Inside Admissions. That's all for now. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time as we continue our journey inside the admissions office.